the um, interesting thing is, is when I found out a few weeks ago that I'd be preaching on this Sunday, I went to my bank of sermons and I uh, asked our staff here, uh, maybe this last week, what would be a, a good message? And I gave them a couple suggestions, and they all said, yeah, the one on hospitality. How many have heard a sermon on hospitality? Anytime uh, you have, okay, good. Uh, but it, I, I don't recall that uh, we've heard one recently. Uh, by the way, we arrived here in Maryland exactly three years ago. Hard to believe it was April 15th on tax day that we arrived. Welcome to Maryland, and the, the home of no taxes and uh, low taxes, okay, the, uh, high taxes, um, but just a great state. We have thoroughly enjoyed it, and, and most of all, we've enjoyed this church, and I truly, truly mean that. So hospitality is not only commended in Scripture, it is also commanded. The church of the 21st century would do well if every congregation took seriously the importance of practicing hospitality. So I want to start off this morning by, uh, by, by telling you a story. And, and this is a true story, by the way. And the story is told of a... Uh, a, a pastor and his wife who were on vacation and they visited a family who had previously been in their church and they'd been attending this new church for about a year and I'll, I'll pick up the story. It says, we were delighted to learn that they were living for the Lord and they were actively involved in a small local church. They had one complaint, however, during the past year that they had attended the church, not one person, not even one of the spiritual leaders, had invited them over for a meal or a time of fellowship. So our friends still did not feel a part of the fellowship and were quite disheartened. Then he goes on and he, he tells another story. He says, an elderly single woman who now attends our church related an experience to me that dramatically illustrates why we need fresh teaching on the subject of Christian hospitality. At one time in her life, she had to travel more than an hour by bus every Sunday to attend a small suburban church. Each Sunday after the Sunday morning service, she would eat alone in a restaurant and then spend the entire afternoon in a park or a library so that she could attend the evening service. She did this for four years. What left her with sour memories of this church was the fact that in four years, no one invited her home to eat a Sunday afternoon meal or to rest. It wasn't until she announced she was leaving that an elderly woman in the church invited her home for a meal on her final Sunday. I think that's, uh, that's indeed tragic, is it not? Uh, in some of my research, there's a man by the name of Mortimer Arias. He said, hospitality is becoming an almost forgotten Christian virtue in our style of life today, particularly in big cities where there are rampant crime on the streets, there are locked in apartments and all their affluence, urban and, and devices which attempt to create privacy in our homes and our lives. And he writes in the New Testament, however, hospitality was a distinctive mark of Christians and Christian communities. It's interesting that if you go back in the uh, early years of, of Christianity, we've been teaching a course here on church history. This is a quote from 96 AD. It's rare to get something that old. And this, this person writes, Indeed, was there ever a visitor in your midst that did not approve your excellent and steadfast faith or did not proclaim the magnificent character of your hospitality? That was so well known in, in the church. Uh, during the first two centuries, near, nearly all the Christian churches across the Roman Empire were characterized by loving Christian hospitality. The church in Rome was the most noted of all. Uh, the famous church historian Adolf Harnack reveals that, quote, listen to this, during the early centuries of Christianity, it was the Roman church more than any other which was distinguished by generosity with which it practiced this virtue, hospitality. A living interest in the collective church of Christ throbbed with peculiar vigor throughout the Roman church, and the practice of hospitality was one of its manifestations, end quote. Uh, it's interesting also that Gustav uh, Stalin makes this remarkable claim. One of the most prominent features in the picture of early Christianity, which is so rich in good works, is undoubtedly its hospitality, end quote. 
so amazing that we have we can go back in church history and see just the phenomenal way that the early Christians demonstrated hospitality to one another. So what I've decided to do is I'm going to make this message a little bit more like a Bible study. So it's going to be participatory. So I have some of you that are going to help me with uh, with some verses. So let, let's start off and let's first have let, let's hear from Romans 12 9 to 13. Thank you, Dennis. Dennis already did that for us. So that passage, Romans 12, 9 to 13, uh, tells us being devoted to one another in brotherly love. And Paul fleshes this out by giving specifics as to what this brotherly love looks like. Notice that the last item on the list is practicing hospitality. I looked at the word practicing. It's, uh, it's the, uh, the Greek word dioko, which is better translated pursue. So the Greek scholar C.K. Barrett renders this phrase, pursue hospitality with enthusiasm. Some people don't even pursue hospitality, much less do it with enthusiasm. Okay, our next passage is Hebrews 13, verses 1 and 2. So, Calvin, if you'll stand and read that for us, please. Hebrews 13, 1 through 2. Let love of the brethren continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. By this, some have entertained angels without them. All right, thank you. And uh, the word brethren is from the word Philadelphia. Uh, and we, we talk about the city of brotherly love. And it places the emphasis on offering hospitality as if you were inviting one of your brothers or sisters to your home. If you perceive these brethren to be like your blood brothers and sisters, you will want to have them in your home. Then the writer adds an amazing statement that some have entertained angels. This was, by the way, in fact, exactly what happened to Abraham, Sarah, Lot, and Gideon in the Old Testament. Kind of amazing. I, I want to read to you uh, some, something else that, that might be a little bit helpful to us. The term brethren or brother or sister occurs some 250 times in the New Testament, particularly in Paul's letters. And, and Peter directly refers to Christians as the brotherhood, 1 Peter 2.17. Sadly, what we know is that by the end of the third century, this whole idea of practicing hospitality began to, to diminish. The reason for this preference for the family aspect of the church is obvious. Only the most intimate of human relationships can begin to express the love, closeness, privileges, and new relationships that exist between God and man. In many practical ways, the local church is the, is the, in the New Testament shows itself to be a close-knit family of brothers and sisters. So think about that. We often say, hey, uh, Brother Chuck, or uh, hey, uh, uh, Brother Dennis, or Brother Calvin, Brother Mark. And, and, and we, we use the word sister because we're part of God's forever family. Aren't you glad for that? Are you glad to be a part of God's forever family? I'm going to try that one again. Are you glad to be a part of God's forever family? Ah, oh, thank you. I, I knew you were there. But just some things, uh, just a, a, a quick smorgasbord of scriptures. The Christians greeted one another with a holy kiss. Now, don't do that in Maryland during the month of March. Uh, you wouldn't want a holy kiss from me about two weeks ago. They shared material possessions. They met in homes, several passages. They ate together. They cared for their widows. Uh, when appropriate, they disciplined their members. Uh, brotherly, uh, brotherliness provided the guiding principle of conduct between members. Uh, and then, they, they, of course, they, they showed hospitality. So are you demonstrating hospitality? Is that, is that part of what you think about on an average week? Oh, I wonder how I can use my home. And I, I want you to think about this. Most churches that I've served, including the very first one, we, we, we purchased a building. It took us several years. We saved up money. And uh, we purchased about a half a million dollar property in 1982. And uh, years later, when the church uh, moved to another property, we sold it for 900000 And so it was a beautiful building. It was an existing building. But in the 180 to 200 people that we had there in that church, I calculated, this is back in the early 80s, that we had uh, at least five million dollars worth of property between between all the members, and you begin wondering. We we gather at this half a million dollar property, but how much do we gather with the 
the, the five million or more. Today, I'm pretty confident in our congregation, be uh, though we're not a large congregation, it wouldn't surprise me if we, if we add up all the real estate that's owned that we're, we, got, we have five million dollars here. And the question is, sometimes churches will say, oh, we need to get a building. We need to get a building. And sometimes do we think, you know, we have a building. Uh, we have a building in our home. We, we, we just did a, an add-on, a, a finished half of the basement. And I'm telling you, we, we love having people over. That was one of the big reasons. We didn't have to get a, a larger house for Sue and me. Uh, although, if I guess I was in the doghouse, I could go to the basement and she could stay up there. But no, we did that because we wanted a larger group when people come over on Wednesday night. So brethren, that's from Philadelphia. It, it means that we want to treat each other like brethren. And that, then who else would, who would, who would take Third John uh, 5 to 8? I believe that's, that's Jake. And there's a commendation here to Gaius. He and the church were, uh, were had, had been giving hospitality, in-house hospitality, but also for strangers. The context tells that they were itinerant preachers that they supported and cared for as they came to and through their area. That's what the New Testament church was known for. And then 1 Timothy 5, 9 and 10. I believe that's Mark. A widow is to be put on the list only if she is not less than 60 years old, having been the wife of one man, having a reputation for good works, and if she has brought up children, if she has shown hospitality to strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she has assisted those in distress, and if she has herself to every good work. Thank you. Think about that. The, the criteria for supporting a widow. She's got to be at least 60 years of age. And, and part of that, uh, that criteria was that she was given to hospitality. Think how important that is. What about 1 Timothy 3, 1 and 2, Charlie? The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. The husband of one wife is sober-minded, self-controlled, Respectable, hospitable, able to teach. Notice in that list of 20, 21 qualifications, one of them is if you're going to be an elder, you have to practice hospitality. It's not an option. So if I, if I met a pastor, and I've met several of the years, and I've known a few of them like this, they, they love to teach and preach, but it's like their home is, that's off, you know. Hey. Uh, d d don't come over. That, that's my private place of domain. Oh, well, that's not true. To be an elder, it says you must be hospitable because it, what, it, what it's doing, it's saying that there's a, a part of your character that's reaching out to people. It's not just when you're in public. It's also when you're in private. The, uh, I wonder how many churches really believe this to be important. We think for a pastor, he should be seminary trained, have a call to preach, be licensed or ordained, but this is a very important aspect of eldering or, or pastoring, opening up our home and our hearts to others. We simply cannot get to know people very well on a Sunday morning only setting. Do you believe that? I do. We need to visit people, counsel with people, have a relationship that goes beyond just the, the formal setting. And I can, I can say that the, among our pastoral staff and elders, we meet with people. We meet with them on a regular basis. There's no one here who could say, you know what, I've tried to get with this group of people and they're just un, they're unreachable. That's just not true. We make that a, a very pri a heavy priority here at Truth Bible Church. So those are the biblical exhortations for hospitality. Second, I want to look at is unbiblical excuses for inhospitality. Put your seatbelt on here. This is going to be the strongest part of this message. I'm going to give you five things that I've heard over the years why people are not hospitable. It's not my gift. Would you just say after me, I know I'm selfish. Go ahead and say it. <laughs> are, are some more naturally gifted in hospitality? Sure, but it's very much like evangelism. Some have the gift of evangelism, but all are called to evangelize. Cooking may not be your gift either, but the family needs to eat. 
I've known of people who uh, they, they weren't good at, if it was at my house, you wouldn't want to come over and get my cooking, but you know what? How much time does it take me to go over to Little Caesars? And, and pick a couple pizzas up and invite you over. How much time does it take, uh, even if you don't have them over, to say, let's, let's go to McDonald's today. Let's, let's go grab lunch. You see, hospitality, it's a mindset. And I want to be clear to say, it's not necessarily at your house, though I think we miss a lot when we don't open the doors to our, our own uh, place of, of where we spend our time. And I'll, I'll talk about that at the end of this message. It's not my gift. Secondly, I don't have the time. Would you repeat after me? I know I'm selfish. <laughs> God would not command us to practice hospitality if he did not supply us enough time. If it's not a priority, then we'll always be too busy because of other things. Third, my house is not ready. Oh, have I heard that one. Would you repeat after me? I know that I'm selfish. What a great incentive to clean the windows and vacuum the carpet. Guests are coming, but do not make the mistake of thinking hospitality can only occur when your house is ready. Every head bowed, every eye closed. How many of you ladies and husbands say, yep, I, I have to admit, I, I only think of entertaining when I have the house really clean. Every, um, uh, go ahead, raise your hand. Wow, some of you, wow, then I'm coming over because most of you didn't raise your hand and said, you're ready now. I'm, I'm coming over for lunch. But we often say that my house is not ready. But do not make the mistake of thinking hospitality can only occur when your house is ready. Because that puts the priority on the externals rather than opening up your heart to people. Remember, your house is to be a servant, not a master. God gave that to you. Fourth, I don't know how to entertain. Go ahead and say it with me. And I know that I'm selfish. Therein lies much of the problem. It's, it's when we have come to assume that we entertain people as opposed to enjoying people and, and serving them. What a wonderful book. It's a classic. It was written way back in the 70s by Karen Main. Some of you might remember it. It was called Open Heart, Open Home. I heard her several times at some of the Sunday school conventions there in Denver. Here's what she writes. Secular entertaining is a terrible bondage. Its source is human pride. Demanding perfection, perfection, fostering the urge to impress. It is a rigorous taskmaster which enslaves. In contrast, scriptural hospitality is a freedom which liberates. Entertaining says, quote, I want to impress you with my beautiful home, my clever decorating, my gourmet cooking, end quote. Hospitality, however, seeks to minister. It says, this home is not mine. It is truly a gift from my master. I am his servant, and I use it as he desires. Hospitality does not try to impress, but to serve. I love that. Hospitality does not try to impress, but to serve. So that's a, that's a question. Have you, have you made that distinction? Have you been thinking of, I, I'm not good at entertaining. Here's the good news. You don't have to be good at it. All you have to do, is, as Karen Maine says, is, is to open, open up your heart. And by the way, it's not that we can't learn, at it, uh, learn about it. There's, there's an excellent book out. When I preached this message back in 2011, I ordered 50 copies from my congregation, The Hospitality Commands by Alexander Strauch. And at the back, he's got 20 or 30 questions that you can ask when you have people over. Sometimes it just, it's just a few questions that can make a difference in, in a conversation. But if you, if you have in your mind a picture, well, well, I don't know what in the world we talk about. You know what, what I found? People love to talk about themselves. Now, how difficult is this to say, Calvin, tell me your story. How many words is that? Calvin, tell me your story. I would love to hear your story. You know what? Nine out of ten people love to hear your story. So find out about people's background. That'll, that'll elicit conversation. You don't have to be really good at interviewing people to learn a few basic questions. And if you do that, it'll make all the difference in having people over. Fifth. Here's the only one that's true out of these. 
I'm selfish and prefer my privacy. How many would say, you know, if, at, the, at the end of the day, come on, I want to see your hands. If, if truth was known, I, I'm not selling for that because <laughs> I'm not selling. How many would say, you know what, truth be known, I would rather be home by myself than having people over. Truth be known. <laughs> Wow, we're going somewhere to dinner every single night this week. I, I know you're being nice, but I, I think that's true. Now, our church, by the way, I want to let you know, in three years being here, I think we're very good. I would give you a high grade. I would give you a high grade because we've been, we've been invited over several different homes. But let's face it, that's a tendency that all of us can have. I'm selfish and prefer my private. Here's an honest excuse, but, but it does not give us an out. Most of us would probably prefer just to spend our evenings and weekends to ourselves, staying home on Sunday night or Friday night, whatever it is, and watching Blue Bloods. Oh, some of you see that, that got your attention. No, I don't like that. Okay, what is it? Golf? What is it you would prefer? What is it you'd prefer to do that you would say, you know what? That's, that's why I don't have people over. I'm so busy. So let's go through that list again. And I, I want you to repeat. It's not my gift. And you're supposed to say, I know I'm selfish. <laughs> I don't have the time. I know I'm selfish. My house is not ready. I don't know how to entertain. And I'm selfish and prefer my privacy. Yeah. You know, growing up, I wanted to have a minute to share this with you. I got to thinking this week, okay, in, in all the churches I've been, you know, <clears throat> through when I was growing up till uh, the first church I served, second, third, this is, the, this is the fourth. I got to thinking, who are the people who were the best at hospitality? And the names came to my mind right away. So I was growing up in, in Rocky Mountain Lake Baptist Church and, and the Alliance Bible Church. Ben and Joe Pritchard, we would love going over to their homes. And we loved going over to Bill and Norma Mumford's house. Isn't it amazing? I can remember Don and Minnie Swanstrom. I can remember their names. Why? Because we were over there a lot. They opened up their home. North Lenny Free, uh, who, who is kind of the uh, chairman of my elder board, Jim and Sharon Wiersma, they're still that way. Just in, and and they, they both had busy lives. Sharon was an RN, and, and, and Jim drove for UPS. But they were always having people over for dinner. Life Fellowship served there 11 years. That name came right away. Tim and Lisa Bates. Just open up their home. Make you feel like you're special. If I say EV free, that's an easy one. I was there 10 years. So who do you think we stayed with and who we had lunch with when we were back there for the Shepherds Conference and went up to my former church? Larry and Patsy Gilbert. They just love people, having people over. Not only did they have us over, they invited several people. I said, well, we don't have to do that. Oh, yeah, we want to have people over. That was one of the first homes we went to when we visited that church uh, almost 11 years ago when we were candidating for the church. They love having, having people over. And, they just, and yet you don't feel like they're putting on any pretenses. You never feel like they have to entertain. But you know they have an open heart and an open home. I could go through uh, people here. It, it's, it, it's pretty striking very quickly who has you over and who doesn't. And there are, there are some wonderful people. And I, I won't mention your names because I don't want you to lose your reward up in heaven. But, but, but think about all the unbiblical excuses that we give for inhospitality. Then here are some biblical examples of hospitality. Uh, the first one is Gaius of, of Romans. Uh, Gaius of Corinth, I'm sorry, in Romans 16, 23. It says, Gaius, host to me and to the whole church greet you. Gaius probably had the church in his house. Gaius, host to me and to the whole church greet you. Then, then we have Gaius of Asia. It's 3 John 5, 8. We have already noted how he was commended by John the Apostle for his generous hospitality to his church family and strangers. No wonder John refers to Gaius as a beloved friend. Now here's one that's a little bit different, and I want us to turn to this. This is Simon the Tanner. So I want you to look up. Actually, I gave this one to Dennis, didn't I? So uh, start in Acts nine. Start in Acts ten, if you would. Okay. Acts ten one. All right, a couple of Now there was a man uh, at Caesarea named Cornelius, a 
centurion of what was called the Italian cohort. And then in verse 17 and 18, now while Peter was greatly perplexed in mind as to what vision which he had seen might be, behold, the men who had been sent by Cornelius, having asked direction for Simon's house, appeared at the gate and calling out. They were asking whether Simon, who was also called Peter, was staying there. And 22 and 23. Mm -hmm. And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, a righteous and God-fearing man, well spoken of by the entire nation of the Jews, was divinely directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and hear a message from you. So he invited them in and gave them lodging. He invited them in and gave them lodging. And Simon the Tanner is, is part of the larger context. Remember, that's where Peter was staying. Now, this is interesting. We know that Peter spent many days in Joppa at the home of Simon the Tanner, which is very interesting because Simon made his living by working with the skins of dead animals. How do you think that affected an Orthodox Jew? An occupation that was despised by the Jews, but his home not only became the center of operations for spreading the gospel in that area, he also had the special privilege of hosting Peter, receiving messengers from Cornelius, and being a partner in the gospel that would be proclaimed to the Gentiles. One of the things that I, I so especially appreciate about my parents is how many people they had come over. Uh, that's people, people say, well, you don't know my church background. It wasn't very fun. I've had people tell me, oh, it was... Ah, people there, people at the church is hypocritical, la, la, You know, I'm a person that looks back and, and church was fun. Why? Because we didn't know whose house we were going over to that evening. And, and folks, we drove Sunday morning 30 minutes there, 30 minutes back. Sunday night, 30 minutes there, 30 minutes back. Wednesday, 30 minutes, 30 back. So don't give me, you're too busy. We never thought about that growing up. We thought about, wow. We get, we get to fellowship with other Christians. That was a great joy. And we have somehow convinced ourselves we're too busy, we're too tired, all the things that I've heard, and yet we're missing the blessing. I got to thinking this week, I remembered something. My parents had over. A missionary couple came and, and, and shared their, uh, their ministry with us. They're in Denver. And, of course, my folks invited them to stay. So they stayed over a couple nights. One of their young men, one of their young boys, I would guess he was probably about 16 or 17 at that time, he had memorized the entire New Testament. And here I'm a young kid about, about 10 or 11 years old that I was just awestruck. And I remember saying, well, and he said, and I, I'm working on the Old Testament now. Really? And so I, I said to him, you know, have you done Daniel 6? You know the one on Lion's in? He started off, gave it word for word perfect. Now I say that to you. Think about this. What if my parents hadn't had him over, had that family over? And one of the great mistakes, you know what? I wish when missionaries came through, I, was with, I wish there was a rush I wish there was a rush. People saying, wow, can we have them over? Uh, you got them for breakfast? Okay, got them for lunch. But we don't. We, we're, we're very happy to hear their ministry and then go our happy way. Sad is the day that we haven't taken advantage of hospitality. And then Philemon. He writes there in, in, in verses 1, 2, 21, and 22, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved brother and fellow worker, and to Thea, our sister, and to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you since I know that you will do even more than what I say. At the same time also, prepare me a lodging, for I know that through your prayers I will be given to you. Philemon had a great track record. Paul felt totally assured that he could simply ask Philemon to prepare a room for him. So that's why when we were going to California, we were in Los Angeles for that conference. Sue was in Santa Maria. She and her mom were going to go up to Visalia. got four or five days. It, 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 it took us about five seconds. Oh, let's call the Gilberts. Let's call the Gilberts. Do you know what? They were in the process of selling their home. They could have easily said, uh, you know what, uh, boy, we'd love to do that, Pastor. They made it happen. They made it happen. They said, we might at 4 o'clock having somebody come over. Oh, we want you here. 
Desire means a lot to God, and desire will have a lot to do with how you handle hospitality. Okay, and then uh, Calvin, if you'll take Lydia, one of my special names, because my mother was named Lydia. Acts 16, uh, 11 through 15, and also verse 40. Putting out to sea from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace on the day following the uh, Minneapolis, and the bears of Philippi, which is a leading city in the district of Macedonia, a Roman colony. We were staying in the city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to Riverside, where we were supposing that it would be a place of prayer. We sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled. A woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, Jesus, broke up her heart to respond to the place of the And when she and her household had been baptized, she urged us, saying, You have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, and in my house this day, she prevailed upon us. They went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia. Yeah, Lydia. And uh, I'm glad they named my mother Lydia because she, she would depict that so well. She was a Lydia of Sold Purple. Uh, we, we actually went to Philippi. I've, got, I've been there a couple times on our journeys to Greece. Um, purple dye was extracted drop by drop from shellfish and the roots of the matter plant. Not only expensive, but a very profitable business. But most important, she was a worshiper of God. She was listening. God opened her heart. God is sovereign in salvation. But he also holds us completely responsible for our sin and our need to seek him. God will never turn away a person who seeks the light. This passage shows God does not need some cleverly devised evangelism strategy or superior skills. Most important is the clarity of the gospel. Notice also in verse 15, the evidence of her salvation, baptism and hospitality. Isn't that amazing? Baptism and hospitality. Um, and then not only biblical examples of hospitality, but then finally biblical effectiveness of hospitality. You see, in, in the New Testament, homes became a hostel. You've heard that expression, right? If you go to Europe, and, and the hotels are called hostels. And this was a, a place for, for strangers. Job 31, 32. I think this is the old, only Old Testament passage I have. And Job said, The alien has not lodged outside, for I have opened my doors to the traveler. What a great verse. So homes become a hostel for strangers. Secondly, homes became a house for worship, according to Romans 16. Three to five. Greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who for my life risked their own necks, to whom not only did I give thanks, but also the churches of the Gentiles also greet the church that is in their house. It became a place for worship. This church, Truth Bible Church, started in the living room of a home about two or three miles from here, in our pastor's home. Homes became a house for worship. Third, Homes became a hub for evangelism and teaching. And this is where I want to go ahead and put up on the screen. This is also on your, uh, on your bulletin. And uh, we, I decided I didn't want to read that because we wouldn't want to read it here at this point. But if, if, you, if you want to turn your Bibles or you want to just look at the screen, we should have it here. Acts 2. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all, as anyone might have need. Day by day... Continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. What a, what a great passage. So, homes became a hub for evangelism. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And then the Lord was adding. Look, look how the Lord was adding. There was something that was so attractive. They estimate that the New Testament church in Jerusalem 
May, in, in, the, in the course of about 20 years, grown to 100,000 people. If you take 5,000 were added, and it doesn't include children, and they believe it's possible that many people were added. They, they, the, the unbelievers saw something that was unique. And I hope I, I get the message across today. Is it possible part of the reason we're not as unique as we could be and should be is because we don't use these homes, these beautiful homes that God has given us. We view it, it's for me. It's for my family. Isn't it God's treasure? Isn't it, isn't it, aren't we being a steward of what God has given to us? Fourth, homes became a hospital for weary souls. This is part of the Philippian jailer experience. That, that we hear about from, from Acts 16. Remember the jailer was going to kill himself and, and Paul said, don't do, do thyself no harm. And then the jailer said, what must I do to be saved? And he said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Uh, then we find from the scripture that after the jailer and his entire family believed and were saved, he took them that very hour of the night, washed their wounds, and immediately was baptized, he and all his household. He brought them into his house and sat before them and rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. Our, our church in, in uh, Visalia, I think I, I think we've told everybody, maybe 400 or so. Do you know what? There are some people there that were just absolutely great at hospitality. You know, there are some people I saw every Sunday, I've never one time invited over their home. Couldn't have a clue. I, I knew where they lived, but was never invited over. And that's true in most churches. And by the way, that's not true in most, uh, most of here. I think I've been in just about every one of your homes. But I'm just saying, make sure your, your house is a hospital for weary souls that you can say, you know, come on over. Someone's hurting. Why don't you come on over and we'll, we'll pray with you. Fifth, homes became a haven for traveling evangelists. Philemon 7.22. What a great verse and testimony about Philemon. We read in verse 7, For I have come to have much joy and comfort in your love, because the hearts of the saints have refreshed, have been refreshed through you, brother. Just a, a couple of things to think about. In the L.A. Times. And it was an example of the high impact that hospitality delivers in communicating love and the familiar nature of the church. This L.A. Times writer visited Christian churches to see how friendly and loving they were. And he, he rated his visitation experience according to this point system. If you were greeted at the door, you got two points. The prepackaged form letter from the pastor got three points. The coffee hour afterwards got five points. Personal invitations to dinner were 60 points. 60 points. The reporter's rating sheet shows how powerfully hospitality communicates love and concern. Over the years, I've heard this. I just don't know anybody. I've, I've ne I don't ever get invited over. I, I've heard that. I mean... I don't want to come across as a whiner to you, but that's usually how it's delivered to me. Nobody ever invites me over. Well, here's a suggestion that might solve the problem. It comes from an actual experience where a couple who had, hard, had a hard time feeling as if they belonged in their congregation. Instead of leaving that church, here's what they did. They decided to invite every person in the church to their home for dinner during the next year. And guess what? By the end of the year, they knew everyone in the church and had made a number of close friendships. You say, well, I can't have people over my home. Well, when it's the last time, I don't know what the, re you know, what the reasons are. To, you, know, uh, you know, I guess, no, I don't want to come to your home if you've got um, three, um, I'm trying to think of the name of the dog, dogs that are uh, pretty dangerous. I, I don't want to come to your home if, if you've got dangerous dogs. You know, I, I don't want to come to your home if, uh, if, you've, uh, if your entire family has the flu. You wouldn't want to come over to my house a couple weeks ago. So I get that. So not, not every home is, is in the best position. Maybe you don't have a, a believing spouse. That's possible. But I want to ask you, why can't you show hospitality and say, you know what, hey, I'm, I'm going to go grab a bite to eat. Would you be my guest today? How much is that going to cost you? An extra 15, 20 bucks? Take those, take those kind of little steps 
and you'll find it, it'll, it will make a tremendous difference. Coming to the close there, I, I remember really well when we went to uh, Athens for the first time. We had uh, met my son, Brett, and his wife, Katie, and Chad and Marissa came over from here, and we all met there in uh, Ukraine and actually drove a van down into to Greece and, and so forth. Because one of the places we went to was Athens, and we were getting ready to go to the Acropolis. And you have to go up these little uh, kind of hilly trails. And on the way up, there were these beautiful, can't you picture these beautiful little Greek restaurants? You know, out, this is a perfect, you know, perfect setting. Uh, the temperature was perfect. And I remember, so you remember this? There was, there was this little old man came out, just dressed in a nice little dinner jacket. He came out, he wasn't hard with me, and he, he introduced himself to me. And I mean, yeah, he's an entrepreneur, but I mean, he sold me, and I wanted to come to his restaurant. So I'd never been to Acropolis before, so we went to Acropolis and did that, and I said, I want to go back there. And we had to ask several people, because there were so many different ways to get back in the city, but I remember we found his restaurant. Why? Because he was friendly. And we never want to forget that. And we've heard a lot about the dangers of the seeker-sensitive church, you know, that, hey, we're going to do everything just to make your life easy. We're not going to tell you the gospel. But make sure we don't become seeker-insensitive either. That's the other extreme. We ought to be the, the, the friendliest people in town. Uh, that's why um, over the years, we just, I told Chad when he came here, hey, put me on for visiting. I think there may be a couple exceptions we haven't got to your house yet. But every single visitor that comes here, we knock on your door. We don't go in unless asked. Knock on the door, hand them a plate of cookies. Why? Because it tells people we care about them. The visit letter, that, that says you care about them, but that actual visit. About two weeks ago, I was with one of our members. And this happened, we were in their area, and, and we were getting together for a different reason. And, uh, and he said to me, hey, why don't you, why don't you just drop into the house for a little bit? I'd, I'd actually never been to his house. And I just loved it. It was only there 15, 20 minutes, but just being in the house. Now I know where they live. And it makes all the difference in the world. Do you know, do you, do you know each other that well? Do you know where, each other, where, where they live? That's, that's the place where they spend most of their time. And I close with this. There's no better example than our Lord Jesus Christ. And I thought about naming this sermon title, Come and See. Because if you go to John 1.38, John the Baptist had two of his disciples. And Jesus had just been baptized. And they came up to Jesus, and they, they were talking about following him and so forth. And one of them, I believe it was Andrew, if I remember correctly, Andrew said... Where are you staying? And Jesus said, didn't say, well, I'm too busy to have people over right now. I'm an itinerant evangelist. Very, three very short words, come and see. Don't you love that? Come and see. And they did. They saw where he was staying, the scripture says, and they stayed with him that day. And so I want to ask you this morning, do you have a come and see? Do you have a come and see attitude? Do you have a hospital hospitality attitude? Or are you saying, it's not my gift? I know I'm... I don't have the time. My house is not ready. I don't know how to entertain. I'm selfish and I prefer my privacy. I hope you take a long, hard look and say, is there any truth to this message? Is there any truth that we as Christians have so got into the privacy aspect? You know, respect your privacy, and we want to respect your privacy. But are you opening up your home? And, and Karen Maine's great thought is you got to first open up your heart. You open up your heart, you will open up your home. Thank you, Lord, for these passages, how that this week, as I've been able to go through them, how they've uh, just intrigued me to saying, Lord, help us to do a better job, first of all, as a couple, and then, Lord, as a church family, of really using these homes you've so blessed us with. And we thank you, Lord, for your incredible generosity. Help us to use these homes for your glory. 
And would it be that our homes could become a hub for evangelism? They could, they could become a haven for those who need rest, those who are weary. And because of that, your name is praised. In Jesus' name, amen.